here today interviewing Justice James J. Fitzgerald III, who's currently a senior judge on the Pennsylvania Superior Court. Good morning, Mr. Mr. Justice. Mr. Hackney, nice to see you again. Thank you very much. Uh, we've uh, uh, we actually, well, you and I have known each other for quite some time, uh, many years. Since 1990. Yeah, okay, <laughs> there we go. And uh, in order to familiarize our uh, viewers with uh, your background, could we start at the beginning and can you tell us a bit about your background? Yes, I grew up in Winchester, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston, 10 miles out of Boston. Came to uh, Philadelphia to look at the University of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. uh, for a college and I uh, saw the Palester and Franklin Field and somebody asked, where do you want to go to school, Jim? And I said, after seeing the Palester in Franklin Field, I don't care if they hold classes in the tent, I'm going to Penn. Probably not the best way to choose a school, but it was a blessing for me because I met my wife here yeah. and had having a wonderful time. I went to Villanova Law School, which is a terrific law school, and graduated from there and married my wife, Carol, who was a Penn student. Uh, oh. That's who we met. Okay. And we have three lovely children, Melissa, uh, Jamie, and Craig, and five lovely grandsons. And uh, I joined the district attorney's office under Alan Spector, yeah. expected to stay two years for some experience, <laughs> right. and liked it so much I stayed 12, and we had some very wonderful people there. And I've been, had a wonderful time as both an assistant district attorney, yes. a private counsel, and uh, also as a judge for now, almost 24 years in different courts. That's great. And uh, we appreciate everything that you've done for the court system. It's been, uh, you've made important contributions. Well, thank you. And uh, so can you tell me a, a little bit about uh, what made you decide to go to law school, to become a lawyer? Well, uh, when I was at Penn, I used to row crew. And uh, before practice on some days, I would come down to City Hall mm -hmm. and watch the trials. Okay. And I said, gee, I want to be a trial lawyer. And that was the impetus for me to go to law school. Right. And I had a, a good uh, career trying cases in the DA's office, homicides, etc. Now, before we get too far from it, you briefly mentioned the fact that you were on the crew team at yes. Penn. As a matter of fact, you rode in uh, two Olympic trials, isn't that right? That's correct. We rode in 60 and 64 in an eight oared shell. And we were the only crew to beat Vesper that we ended up winning the gold okay. medal at the Tokyo Olympics, and they were a great crew. Yeah. And uh, so uh, it was unsuccessful, what we did, uh, but we were very, very close, and I'm glad I had the opportunity to go as far as I could in the now, rowing. Just qualifying for the Olympic trials is an achievement in itself. So, Thank you. Yeah. Now, uh, were there any, at the time that you became a lawyer and during your early career, and you mentioned uh, uh, now Chief Justice Ron Castile and other famous names, were, were there, was there a, a, maybe some uh, very important landmark case or was there a particular giant of the law, if you will, someone uh, who inspired you or who impressed you? Yes, uh, I had the good fortune of being in court almost every day in the district attorney's office. And the three judges really that had the most influence on me mm -hmm. ended up being Chief Justice uh, Robert N.C. Nix. Okay. Uh, and he was very forceful in the courtroom, very knowledgeable. He controlled the courtroom with the power uh, of his personality. Right. And uh, the juries listened to him very carefully. Uh -huh. And uh, he was an excellent jurist and followed by uh, Justice uh, Juanita Kid Stout. Right. And uh, she was a highly intelligent uh, judge, and she had been on the appeals division of the district attorney's office, knew the law inside and out, and had a charm about her. She did. And I she controlled her, her courtroom uh, with her knowledge and a very charming way, so lawyers behaved and tried the case properly. And then Judge John R. Meade, uh, he looked upon the court staff and the lawyers as, and himself as part of a team okay. and ran the courtroom as a team concept with each one being an advocate where they should be advocates right. but not being obstreperous and making the system roll and work. And uh, I sort of tried to pattern myself after those three judges. We also had fine judges like uh, uh, former administrative judge Edward Blake 
who was yes. an outstanding jurist uh, and administrator and a highly respected uh, judge in James Kavanaugh, right. who went on to the Superior Court, and of course uh, Justice uh, uh, Mc James T. McDermott, right. uh, who was a dynamic judge uh, with a flair and tremendous knowledge of the law. So I had, I was spoiled. I was before wonderful <laughs> judges <laughs> right. there almost every day of my 12 years in the DA's office. So I had the right people that really taught me how to be a judge. And you've tried to emulate them. And that's interesting about uh, the, the very balanced control that a judge might exert at a courtroom. Uh, do you think that the practice of law then uh, and before those judges was different than the practice of law now, or is it? Well, I would say no. Uh, I think we have excellent judges in the Philadelphia Common Police Court right now okay. who take their job seriously. They and I realize being a judge is a privilege and the most wonderful job in the world. Mm -hmm. Not because it's easy, but right. because it's important. You're influencing people's lives and you have a responsibility to do it with knowledge, compassion, fairness, and dignity. And I think wow. if you conduct a courtroom in that way, yes. you have the uh, backing and you have the uh, uh, support of the litigants that appear before you, uh -huh. as well as the judge and your fellow opponents. So we're here to find the truth, make sure the truth comes out, and apply the law to the facts as found and render a fair decision in each case. That's great. I can't think of any uh, better way to put it than that. Uh, now, how about uh, your judicial career? Could you tell us about how you uh, began in the position of a common pleas court judge and as you moved on through the various... Yes, cases. I had run for city controller of Philadelphia in 1979 mm -hmm. and my opponent got 222,000 votes and I got 200,000 votes as a Republican <laughs> and uh, Governor Thornburg appointed me as a chief counsel of the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board in 1980, stayed there for a couple of years, came back and represented Johns Manville uh, in the asbestos litigation right. uh, with the Marshall Dennehy firm and then joined the Chamber of Commerce when uh, uh, John Manville went to Chapter 11 okay. and became their Executive Vice President for Government Affairs and worked under three dynamic leaders of the Chamber of Commerce. Thatcher Longstreth had just left and uh, G. Fred DeBona, unfortunately mm -hmm. has passed away, yeah. was a dynamic leader of the Chamber, followed by Nick De Benedictus uh -huh. and followed by Charlie Peasy. Wow. So I had three wonderful leaders. Yeah and they supported me when I ran for judge in 1989. And uh, I ran on the Democratic ticket as well as the Republican tickets. And Ed Rendell supported me on the Democratic ticket. Right. He, he had just left the DA's office as a district attorney and it was before the 1991 election okay. for mayor. And uh, through his help and my, wealth, my wife's help and other people were so kind to me, yeah. uh, I was able to uh, become a common police court judge and Judge Edward Blake was the administrative judge. He put me right into the criminal trial division due to my experience, and I went to the list rooms, and then I handled a track program, and Judge Davis, now on the federal bench, right. uh, was the leader of the criminal section, mm -hmm. and uh, he did a wonderful job, and we just, he disposed of 5,000 cases, got rid of much of the backlog on the criminal side. I came in the next year and uh, disposed of 4,000 cases then I moved to the major trial division and tried all sorts of major cases. And then I spent four years in the homicide division right. trying homicide cases. And eventually I became the administrative judge in 2002 uh, until 2007 when the governor, uh, excuse me, when I was nominated, yes, when the governor, Rendell, nominated me for an opening on the bench as an interim justice. Right. Uh, okay. And uh, I was uh, basically uh, confirmed by the Pennsylvania Senate. Yes. And, uh, one question that uh, uh, President Pro Tem Scarnati asked me, he said, as the interview was going along, I needed Senate confirmation, two-thirds of the vote. Right. And he said, uh, he said, Judge, tell me something bad about yourself. <laughs> and I thought, and I said, well, uh, you can say, well, I work so hard, it's bad for my health. It's sort of a uh, pat on the back criticism of yourself. Right. And I couldn't think of anything. And I said, uh, Senator, I said, 
I don't have the answer to your question. I said, but please pick up your phone and call my wife. She'll tell you more than one bad thing about me. So he said, you'll be confirmed. And uh, so that, that occurred, and I had a wonderful time on the Supreme what Court. What a great well. answer. That's wonderful. Uh, now, your time as an administrative judge, and a lot of people may not realize that uh, some uh, judges in the Philadelphia court system, or actually very few of them, are appointed by the Supreme Court as uh, administrative judges, and that requires them, as it did you, to work with the actual running of the court system uh, and the business of the court, not only hearing cases, uh, which you were, had already done for so long. Uh, what sort of experiences did you have then? I, and that's, I consider that to be a real achievement. Well, I gained uh, experience in my 12 years in the DA's office. I was chief of the felony waiver division at that time. And uh, so I dealt with court administrators uh, yeah. at that point and the running of the court system. So I was coming back as an administrator, really, in the court system. Mm -hmm. And we had great court administrators, Joe Chiron. David Lawrence, yourself, and others uh, who really were helpful. And uh, as the administrative judge, I had terrific supervising judges and Judge Manfredi mm -hmm. on the civil oh, yeah. side and Judge Keogh on the criminal side. And we had the support of the Supreme Court. And my philosophy was we had to get the backlog down on the criminal side because when I came in, the civil side was being very well run. It had mm -hmm. gone through a trans transformation over five years to get rid of the backlog of civil right. cases through a day forward, day backward program. The Commerce Court had just been initiated by a prior administrative judge, John Heron, uh -huh. and that was really a, a recognized court throughout Pennsylvania and was a challenge really to the quality of the, uh, it was all up to the level of the Delaware Chancery Court, which was the primary business court in the country, and had great success. Uh, and uh, so we kept that going, obviously, and uh, we kept the civil side going. They had advanced resources given to them to get rid of that backlog. Yes. We transferred some of the uh, judges over to the criminal to get that backlog knocked down, which we did. Uh -huh. But the philosophy was yeah. to uh, put judges into, in assignments where they could do the best job, where they liked being and had knowledge of it. And so we created, I hope, tranquility in the sense of judges being happy where they were assigned, yes. doing the work that they did best, and it was very helpful to the system. I'm, generally, I think that if people are uh, happy and pleased in their work, they're going to do a better job. I think it just one follows the other. Right. Yeah. And we had to also, just to go over the numbers, uh, I was in charge of uh, 66 commission judges and 12 senior judges and a thousand employees when you put the probation department in with that as right. well. Yeah. And budgets ranging from 46 to $50 million a year. That was just the trial division. Yeah. And uh, Which is the largest division in the Court of Common Pleas. The though. largest division. It's the second largest court in Pennsylvania. It's okay. bigger than Allegheny County with 46 judges. <laughs> we have 66 plus 12 seniors. So just in the trial division. Just in the trial division. Yeah. And uh, so it was a huge operation. And uh, we worked long hours on it. I guess I was working 10 to 12 hours a day. And mm -hmm. uh, someone said, what's it like being the administrative judge? I said, well, it's people from 9 to 5 and paper from 5 to 9. So that <laughs> completes the 12-hour day. Oh, right. But uh, we, I loved all of our judges. Uh, they were just fine. They are just fine people. Yeah. And so it was a pleasure and a privilege for me to be the administrative judge. Yeah. And uh, you did a particularly good job. Well, you're kind as, of say that. Yes. Now that that also that appointment as administrative judge also placed you on the administrative governing board. It did. Which was even more responsibility uh, on top of the other, so that the board, which is made up of the president and administrative judges, and, and aided by the court administrator make some major decisions about how the entire court system is going right. to be run. So that, to me, also just uh, adds on to the accolades that I think you deserve, and I appreciate the work you've done for the court. Well, thank you.
Well, the Administrative Governing Board, of course, ran the court system here mm -hmm. under the auspices of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Right. And Zygmunt Pines was the uh, court administrator for the entire state right. out of the Supreme Court who did a magnificent job and still does. And he attended all those meetings along with the president, judges of each division, uh, orphans court, uh, family court, and so forth. The names are familiar to everybody. And uh, also the administrative judges from the different courts. So we had an excellent group of people right. running the system. And uh, Zygmunt Pines, of course, kept the Supreme Court informed of everything we were doing here in Philadelphia. And uh, one particular thing that the Supreme Court was very, very happy about, uh, the state courts uh, uh, did a uh, study of the Civil Trial Division. Yes. And they came back uh, with the National Center for State Courts, right, that is. I recall. And they came back and said that the Philadelphia Civil Trial Division was the best civil run division of any major city in the country. Wow. And Chief Justice Cappy was thrilled yeah. with that. And we continued uh, really keeping the civil section a, a high performing yeah. uh, unit. Okay. Now, uh, uh, to sort of move on to uh, your, your personal views, what... Well, we try and stay away from those. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. But if you wanted to give somebody that was just starting out on their, in their law career yes. uh, some advice, or maybe in a judicial career, whichever, or both if you'd prefer, what, what, what would that advice be? Well, the advice is the person must like what they're doing to start with. Mm -hmm. If they don't, they're not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. America is a land of competition, yeah. and if you're going to compete with people that are talented in an area, you must be talented and inspired yourself. Okay. Uh, get involved in civic activities if you're a lawyer who wants to become a judge. Get involved with political activity. That sounds like, you know, it's a, not a nice sounding thing to say, but there are wholesome things going on in politics as well. We sure. read about the things that aren't so good in the newspaper mm -hmm. and on the news, but many good things are happening in civic organizations and politics. And be genuine in what you do. And always be fair. And don't make decisions for your own advancement. Make decisions for the betterment of the people that will be influenced by that decision. And uh, I think over a period of time, the general public and others will recognize that you're doing the right thing for the, for the right reason, and that's what sort of over a period of time might lead you to a judgeship. And of course, life is a, a lot of luck happens too, and so uh, sometimes you don't always get what you want, yeah. uh, but uh, that's the course or the path I would suggest to somebody. And uh, you know, right now, judges are elected, so uh, there's no way to look past the politics. But it's, it's also good that you mentioned that it's a transition over time uh, and that it's important to be patient and continue to uh, contribute uh, over a, a sometimes what could be a long uh, right. amount of time. And also make sure your family is behind you in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's Very important. really necessary and extremely helpful and that way you go out with a clear conscience uh, to do what you think is proper and right to do. Yeah, and, and just that, uh, being comfortable and knowing that your family's behind you and that you're doing the proper thing in your work True, is ideal, I think. I think one thing that I came out of uh, the election for city controller and judge 10 years apart, mm -hmm. as an assistant district attorney I was in all sections of the city for preliminary oh, hearings and other things such as that. And I got to know people pretty well in every section of the city. But running for office when you campaign hard and you go to the various areas of the city, I came away with uh, the feeling that every section of the city has wonderful people in it. They're looking for safety. They're looking for jobs. They're looking for a nice place to bring up their family. Right. So all I can say is the people of Philadelphia are wonderful people, and they're a joy to interact with and you feel very rewarded if you can be helpful to them as well. That's great. I mean, that's just a great attitude. Um, what about your current assignment? Are you, are you uh, happy? That yes. Still uh, my chambers are the most beautiful chambers in Pennsylvania. How I have them, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I'm at 6th and Walnut, 
and I look right out my 17th floor window, yes. and I see the Constitution Center, the Liberty Bell, wow. oh, okay. Independence Hall. Yeah. And being a trial judge, when you walk on the bench, your juices start to flow because it's like being the referee in the game. Yeah. So every morning I look out my window for 30 seconds and said, say to myself, you are so privileged to be looking out on the greatest two blocks of history in America. How about it? So then I can sit down and really go to work inspired. And uh, so that's really what gets Very me going. Well. That's, right. that's a great anecdote. I like that. Story. And the Superior Court. Uh, I have a full caseload like any other judge. We have okay. 15 judges on the court who are elected uh -huh. and usually five senior judges. I'm a senior judge. I have four law clerks like every other judge on the court and two secretaries. And we dispose, not myself, but I dispose probably about 850 cases a year, which like 275 are mine. And uh, the rest uh, are written by other judges, which I review. Yeah. And the court does a tremendous amount of business. Uh, in deciding cases and really we make most of the law in Pennsylvania. The Supreme Court takes a limited number of cases, right. about 130 to 50 a year, and uh, they are important cases they take and they spend as much time at work, if not more than we do, and uh, I guess we're doing 50 hour week uh, work weeks uh, ourselves, and uh, so we try and really make decisions which are going to have a positive impact on people in Pennsylvania. Well, I had no idea that it was that heavy a caseload, and uh, it's pretty impressive. You're still hard at work. I'm still very hard at work, and I don't have any hobbies, so I don't mind that at all. <laughs> and the children are gone, but uh, right. uh, I'm very fortunate to have the position I have. But congratulations. But I'm not disposing of 5,200. I'm, out of those 5,200 dispositions, I'm disposing of about 850. Uh, as I say, one third of them are mine, and two thirds uh -huh. are other judges. Oh, is that all? <laughs> yes, that's all. That's right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> is there anything that I haven't touched on that you think is important that you'd like to? Uh, as I said before, being a judge is a privilege mm -hmm. and an honor, with a lot of responsibility. So I have been fortunate that my career, through good luck, whatever has been involved with it, has really progressed exactly what I, how I want it to be. I love being as an assistant district attorney. I love being in the Chamber of Commerce and trying cases for the Marshall Dennehy firm. And uh, I was so fortunate to be elected as a judge mm -hmm. and to like everybody I have worked with, both in administration uh, as a common police court judge as well as my fellow judges. So I have been a happy person uh, working hard in what I have done in my entire career. Uh, beginning in 1966 when I graduated from Villanova Law School and uh, I've been in organizations such as the Flag Day Association, yes. uh, vice president there and uh, I was fortunate to be uh, receive their award, and, uh, the Lewis Brandeis Jewish Law Day Award in 2007. Uh, Involved with the Brayhan Society. The Brayhan Society Awards, right, and the um, Fortunate, I'm going to receive the uh, St. Thomas More Award from the St. Thomas More Society in uh, three weeks. Yes. And uh, so uh, I have been rewarded overly for what I've contributed. I appreciate that as well. And uh, it's just been a wonderful life. And uh, God willing, uh, I'll have a few more years left on the Superior Court. And as long as I can see my friends at the Common Pleas Court and the lawyers and uh, my family and friends, and I'm truly blessed, and uh, I appreciate that. Well, again, thank you very much, Mr. Justice, for coming today and for contributing all that you have through the years. Thank you, Len. Very nice to be here. Yes, Justice James J. Fitzgerald III.